Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and, and talk about this stuff. Um, as uh, Rano mentioned, I, I was the black sheep in the family who went to teacher. My younger brother is also a teacher, so in the family we have two teams. Um, but in, in this work, I, so I, I taught for about, well, for 10 years. And um, it, 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 my mother is, thinks it's the funniest thing. Nobody would ever have predicted from anything that I did in school that spelling and business is something that I would do. Like that is, I was always a terrible speller in, as a student. And I remained a terrible speller uh, as a teacher. Uh, and, and I still certainly make lots of mistakes. But it wasn't until my ninth year of teaching that I encountered a teaching resource that made the crazy suggestion that English spelling is actually an incredibly well-organized system. Um, and that linguists have long understood this. And it's just that in education, we seem to have missed this somehow. Um, and that sounded fairly crazy to me. But I started to work with this stuff. And it, I was teaching grade four at the time. And it just totally turned around. Make, making sense of all sorts of words that I had always assumed were crazy. Um, and then, so I did, I taught grade four with this stuff for a year and it kind of, my, my wife was teaching grade three, I was teaching grade four, uh, other teacher was teaching grade five and we just kind of kept going and going and then it kind of grew in the school and then I, I, I came, we were teaching overseas at the time and I came to Canada and I couldn't, I couldn't get anybody to listen to me. So, and they would always say, where's the research? And they're, I don't know, I'm a teacher, I don't know, <laughs> was the way I thought. And then I said, okay, I'll go do the research. So I started my master's with John Kirby. And I went there determined to have an answer to this question. Um, so I did what they always tell you never to do when you do master's. And I started, I, from day one, I was going to do an intervention study because my whole point was to be able to answer that question. And so I did. Uh, start planning it and with great uh, help from uh, John Kirby and others managed to do a grade four or five intervention uh, in, a lo in local public schools and we found good results and in the um, in my PhD I ended up uh, publishing the vocabulary aspect to that we're going to talk about the role of this morphology thing that we'll look at and how Understanding morphology helps us get access to so many more words. Um, and my particular interest is that that research has been building up for quite a time, but the, the idea of teaching morphology is kind of came after that. If, if we learn words by knowing how they're built, just kind of by living in the language, what happens if we teach how that stuff works? And that's what I ran into when I ran into this real spelling stuff that I'll, I'll point you to. Um, so that was, and then I, so I, now I'm trying to finish the PhD and we'll talk a little bit about the other research that I did that's also on instructional stuff. But what I think I should probably do is jump in. So here are just some examples from classrooms at all grade levels, um, working with these bases, prefixes, and suffixes in different way. Um, but in that, that first study that we published uh, in a vocabulary thing, I, I came, I was trying to articulate the, not only am I teaching about basis, prefix, and suffixes, I, was, I wanted to come up with a way to teach the, what was the approach with which I taught that. And the, the, the phrase that I liked was structured word inquiry. And it was the, because what got me in the first place with this stuff was that it was inquiry. It was like doing science where the content of the science was the spelling system. And it never occurred to me that somebody could do science with that because I thought spelling was crazy. So why would you, who would be crazy enough to inquire into something that's disorganized? So that's kind of central. So this idea of developing literacy and critical thinking skills by making sense of English spelling through inquiry. I don't, you may have seen this one, I don't know. I, I was reminded of this sentence the other day and it's wonderful. This says, how to recognize speech. Right? How to recognize <laughs> Those two sentences sound exactly the same. But they are absolutely unrelated in, in meaning, aren't they? How to recognize speech. If I just say it, you don't know which sentence I meant. 
you might have thought if I had a picture of a beach with somebody destroying it, you'd think one thing. If I had a, a picture about speech, you would assume it meant that. What this is a nice little signal of is that in English, if this happens, and homophones and all sorts of things, the writing system can't be just the oral language written down. It's not just taking the sounds and putting them in, in letters. There must be something more for this kind of thing to happen. If I say to you to write down the word two, you don't know which two to write down. If I say right here, you don't know which here to write down. See, there's this, English is full of homophones. And there's a principle that I discovered by doing this stuff that says, in English, when two words sound the same, but are different in meaning, spelling has evolved where possible, and that's an important caveat, where possible to separate those meanings with different spellings. And that's, it turns out in English, we have tons of homophones. We also do have homographs. And you can, if you think about the morphology, homophone, we have the phone for sound. Homograph, we have the graph for writing. It's easy to remember which is which. Um, we do have homographs, but not nearly as many as we do homophones. So I, I, I just think that's a cool sentence. Let's take a look at a little list and just read that. And could you let me know, just toss out, who does this? What's the title of this list? Don't be shy, just shout it out. Sorry? I just can't hear. Blooms, perhaps? Oh, yeah, blooms, yeah. And, and I would, this is like scientists, isn't it? This is what scientists do. This is what, what we want kids to do in the classroom, isn't it? This, this is, now, what it turns out, this is, act, you, I think you know about the IB, International Baccalaureate. This is the PYP, the primary program that is just the initial version of the IB. And whether it's the PYP or any curriculum, they always are talking about this is the kind of stuff, sorry, that we want kids to do. Critical thinking, problem solving, all that kind of stuff. And they say, their definition is the process initiated by the teacher or the learner that moves the learner from the current level of understanding to a new and deeper level. That, and then they give these examples. But they also say, and I really like this, involves synthesis, analysis, and manipulation of knowledge. That's what we do when we're doing critical analysis of things. And things like collecting data, clarifying existing ideas, reappraising uh, things, deepening understanding through application of a concept rule, testing theories, all this great stuff. Now, when I was teaching elementary school, that's what I loved to do. And that's why I hated teaching spelling, because that wasn't available. We were doing memorization of words one at a time. It sucked, <laughs> basically. And I was a bad speller. How important could spelling be? I'm a grade four teacher, and I'm a bad speller, and I'm a pretty good teacher. How important could spelling be? Spell check. And, and, but it was, it was a, f a poor argument. Because being a bad speller for an elementary student can be a major hindrance that's going to affect them all the way through high school and anything else they do. Because when you're a bad speller, so many kids, I was lucky, my parents didn't give me a hard time for being so terrible at it. Some parents are pretty heavy duty on their kids who spell poorly. Um, and the, the self-concept that kids have when they're bad spellers can really diminish all that experience. And what do they do? They don't say what they think, they say what they can spell that's close to what they think. So there's all sorts of reasons why my original thought was bad, but I saw nothing that worked. I never saw spelling tests help anybody. They never helped me. The kids who spelled well kept spelling well. The kids who spelled poorly kept spelling poorly. But what we, what we need to know, the other thing about this, um, scientific inquiry is you need a prerequisite for inquiry is access to reliable and verifiable data. If you don't have that, you can't do inquiry. We can't do this stuff. But what got me into what I'm going to show you today is that it wasn't until I, someone showed me the linguistic structure of English that I realized this is a list of what spelling instruction is. But I've never had anybody suggest when I show that list, oh, that's what spelling instruction is. And so what I want to show to you is some evidence, and it's going to be brief and fast, of doing that with the spelling of words in a way that isn't build, it's not targeting spelling accuracy. It's, it actually helps spelling accuracy, but it's targeting understanding how 
to get at the meaning of words and have new ideas. So what I'm kind of doing is let's test our systems for teaching spelling against the spelling system. We have been taught in schools as students and we have been trained as teachers to teach spelling. We know there are systems for teaching spelling in schools. Let's be scientific about it and test how well they match up against words. Well, if you look at this list, it's kind of a random list. It's got a lot of high frequency words, some other le less frequent words, young words, old words. But you know, imagine a kid asking you, oh, I, I will interrupt. You, hopefully you have access to a handout and I don't want you to think you're following along that handout with this talk. That handout is a way for you to have resources and links afterwards. We'll touch on things that are there. Um, but I forgot to say that at the beginning. So if you don't have a handout, make sure you get one before you leave so you can see links and stuff. Sorry. Um, but if you look at this list, you can put your head in the mind of a student that you know who's a bad speller. And just for a second, pick a word. For example, I'll take the first one. What would a kid say if, if a kid said, they don't know how to spell the word cries, what do they not know how to spell? What would they not know? What would be weird about cries? Why, why is, is there an IE in cries? Okay. And the question to ask yourself, could you explain it to them? Now look at the whole list. Is there a word there that you can explain why it's spelled as it is or words that you can't? Well, I'll just take you through for time. For example, helpful, why does helpful have one L but full has two? And, you know, laughed, painted, used, sled. Why, are, why have I grouped those words? What's funny about those? They, have EDs. they all have EDs at the end and none of the EDs are pronounced the same. Right? And does, well, of course, that's just crazy. I was taught dirty old eggs stink. That was how I was supposed to remember does. Um, stopper and proper, wait a second, they sound the same, but one has a double P and one doesn't. What about those CVC rules and bankruptcy? What's weird about bankruptcy? Why is there a T in bankruptcy? You don't hear it. Now go back to the how to recognize speech thing. All of these words I've highlighted because we're confused about the sound letter correspondence, but that's as if every speech was supposed to be written down or everything written down was supposed to be spoken. But what we're, learn, what we're gonna learn is that that's not the only part of it. In fact, how letters and sounds are associated with each other also have to look at other things. Look at the word bankruptcy. What word is connected to bankruptcy where you hear the T? Bankrupt. Oh, there's a CY suffix. You might not know it, but you can hop over your dictionary and check it out, there it is. So the fact, that, the fact that we don't hear the T when we say bankruptcy, the way the English spelling system evolved, it didn't say, let's change the spelling every time the pronunciation change, let's leave the spelling of these parts as a marker for meaning, even when the pronunciation changes, and that's central to what we're gonna look at. And here's a question, what should we do if our data, if our spelling instruction doesn't explain these words, and I'm going to show you just a few of these words, but I can tell you that every word on this list is totally, totally in harmony with the conventions of English spelling. But our instruction isn't teaching us how those work. And so that's what we, we need to do. We need to question those assumptions. Now, I told you I was a really bad speller. Now, I put that in brackets because I didn't want to give away the spelling. Here's, here's my little story that I just told the people I was working with before. When I was teaching grade four, um, I had a kid in, who was in my um, a class who was on a, a contract where you have to write, I had to write his homework book at the end of the day with the parents and stuff. And so I was trying to write, you know, Johnny had a really good day. And I, I oops, I wrote this. And I stopped. Why did I stop? I didn't think about how many times my brain had read and seen the spelling of really, and my brain, for whatever reason, was wired such that it didn't remember. And I'm writing a note to a parent. I can't misspell really to a parent. It's kind of embarrassing. So I'm looking at my dictionary, ah, oh, two L's, I put it, I put it down, and, and I send the kid off, and but the thing is, if you think, and I know that you guys are, t a lot of you are working with older kids, but the same thing happens. And as I close my dictionary, 
the thought is in my head, and I remember it so distinctly, if I have to write that word tomorrow to a parent, I'll have to look it up again. My brain can't remember this. Other people's do, mine didn't. And it's just this frustration thing. And the other story that happened is that then I go and I tell the, I talk to the librarian one day, and I say, I'm recounting this embarrassing story. Ugh, I can't believe it, I had to look up really. And the, and, the t and the librarian says to me, and she's a nice lady, she's not meaning to be mean, but she says, oh, Pete, of course it's two L's, it's real Lee. And I say, and I apologize to the people hearing the story the second time, I say, well, how do you know it's real Lee? How do you know it's not real E? And she didn't really have an answer for me. Now say the word really. Say it. Really. Is there anything in the pronunciation of that word that tells you it must have two L's? There is nothing. You can't know that. You know from the U that there's at least an L, but it doesn't tell you how many. And the, how did that teacher know to do that? Because they already knew how to spell it. So they are telling me how to remember, they're telling me, remember how to pronounce it. They're giving me a strategy that only works if I already know how to spell it. And, the, and they think they're helping me. But actually, they're not. Actually, what they're doing, put your, now pretend I'm not a teacher who's you know, fairly confident and doesn't worry about this. Imagine I'm now a kid and what the teacher is saying. It's easy, just remember real Lee. And the teacher doesn't, the kid doesn't have the confidence to ask, well, how do you know it's, they don't, they don't ask that question. And what the message the kid gets is, what, are you stupid? Everybody knows this, and other kids do. And I can't get it, no matter what you tell me, I don't know. And now you feel stupid, and now you move away from literacy stuff, because usually when you run into literacy stuff, it just feels bad. So this is where it's important that we understand how this works. This is how long it took me to understand really. After nine years of teaching, I was at this workshop, and uh, the, the, the guy who was showing me this stuff wrote down the word really, and he just said this, what does the word real mean? And so it's like a real, it's a really, it's like a really nice day, okay. How is the word built? That means, oh, is, oh, I should write the word really, we know it's two L's now. Is it a base? Or is it a base with something else? Can you, can you analyze a prefix or suffix off of the word really? Come on, don't be shy. Is there is a suffix, isn't there? And so this is what my, this person did. He said R-E-A-L plus L-Y is rewritten as R-E-A-L-L-Y. That is how long it took me to never have to look in a dictionary again for that word. All somebody needed to show my brain was how it worked. Thousands and thousands and thousands of times of reading didn't do it. One event of understanding done. But it's not just about that. What he did, now he puts it in a matrix, so I need to still be able to work in here. So we can put, he makes this thing called a matrix. So he puts the LY there. Can you think of another prefix or suffix that we could put fixed to this base? And I don't know, I think most of you are older, but this is also something I can do in grade one. I could even do in preschool. This is real, it's a really nice day. Something is real, it's not real, it's unreal. So I could do this without letters. I could teach orally this structure, and now I need to go, oh, well we write this un prefix, un. Something's unreal. There's no word unreally, but there is a word unreal, and there is a word really. Give me another one. Ah, realistic. Ah, excellent. So what's the first suffix in realistic? I-S-T. And then I need to add an I-C. And if I want realistically, that, it's amazing how much this happens. The other group did exactly the same thing. I need an A-L and an L-Y. And I, I got to make this bigger now. It's amazing how often this stuff happens. Anyways, we'll get here. Okay, how about, who can give me a word where the pronunciation of this R-E-A-L changes. Yeah. Ah, you're talking about the E-A, excellent. That the E-A can be long, represent long or short phoneme. But how about with the, I can add a suffix, watch what happens when I add a suffix that you know and a word that you know, reality. Ah, now notice there's another word real homophone that doesn't have any connection in meaning. 
How come I can't spell real, surreal, unreal, realistic, all those words with a double E? Well, I can't do that because the spelling of this base, and there's something we need to learn about that, but the spelling of this isn't, it's not just enough to know the sound letter correspondences in this word, you have to know the, all the possible sound letter correspondences with the words it can build. And the double E is boring in English, it's always but always E. And fishing reel, uh, I can reeling in a fish, you know, movie reels, they, they, the pronunciation never changes, so it can just be a double E. So, so it's not about just learning how to spell really. It's about a window to how the system works. And that's kind of what we're up on about here. Now, what I do in a classroom is if I'm going to work on this, I, I go ahead and I, I build some words. I can show you how you could find this. Why don't I do that? Because one of the links that you have in your handout is to this page. Uh, so you don't have to worry about writing it down. It's in your notes. If I want to go R-E-A-L, this goes through a bank of 60,000 words. And I can just look. Ooh. How about cereal? Does cereal, is it related? Does cereal have an R-E-A-L base word in it? No, there's no C-E prefix. There's no meaning connection. So when you do this with kids, you have to do the thinking. But this gives you a pile of words. I do have interesting words like realist, real, uh, surreal. Um, but you have to do the work of sorting out which ones work and which ones don't. But you don't have to have the answers in your head. So I built a matrix based on this stuff. The kids could work on the words. You notice surreal is in there, all that. And now we, we make a matrix with all these things. So what we're, what we're doing here is I want to, what, I want, what I was taught as a kid, what I was trained as a teacher, what I taught for nine years, were rules of thumb about how English spelling works based on the surface patterns. Okay, and if you look at these words, unhelpfulness, does, hopping, hoping, of course they confuse business. Nobody says unhelpfulness is, is an irregular word. But how does the kid know not to spell N-I-S? Helpfulness, I say in this, why don't I write N-I-S? Because it takes a suffix spelled N-E-double-S that is forever spelled N-E-double-S, it's never, it doesn't change depending on the word it's in. If that's the suffix, I spell N-E-double-S. And what about does? Oh my gosh. One of those crazy words that we're just, we're, we're, we're stuck with this as teachers and kids. And we're, we're so nice to kids. We say, oh, I know, you, 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 I'm sorry, you, you got a bum language. It's just, you know, we'll, we'll have fun with it. We'll play games with it. We'll, we'll do all sorts of cool things with it. But you're going to, we'll, we'll get it. But we'll put it on the regular word list and we'll memorize those. So then you'll get them when all we had to do was show them how it was built. I do, he does. Done. And if we dive into that one, we can use that matrix again, and we can build does, doing, done. And show that it's identical to the structure of goes, going, gone. Now, I have never seen goes in those high frequency irregular word lists, but does always. But they use the same structure. And the principle that's missing from our understanding of spelling is this principle that I think I've signaled already, but let's be more specific. It's a principle of English that isn't, is not true of every language. It's particularly true of English. There's variations in other language that bases, prefixes, and suffixes in English, their pronunciation shifts all over the place. But their spelling is consistent. Rano mentioned the morphemic consistency idea. That is a feature of how our system works. It's not spelling's fault that we say does and do. The words does and do existed before we had a system for spelling them. Oral language happened first, written language after. And for whatever, whether we like it or not, whether we agree it was a smart idea or not, the way it evolved was to help readers, native speakers of the language, be able to see the cues. And, and the way it evolved is basis, prefixes, and suffixes were spelled the same despite pronunciation shifts. And now we can make that into our word wall. And, and it's not a word wall now. Now it's a word concept wall. 
I have a whole bunch of high frequency words for kids to have from the beginning of instruction and they aren't taught by their teacher from the beginning especially to those who struggle yeah reading and writing is going to be hard because there's all these irregular words it's just oh I don't understand every spelling but they all make sense and we'll see how we'll investigate them and it's kind of cool what's the first two words there one is pudding and one is putting and there's no way to know which Stop or improper? Well, when you look at the substructure, they make sense. There's a different reason for the double T in pudding than there is in putting. And proper is a base. So it doesn't need the double P the way that stopper does. But we can't teach those, we must teach sound letter correspondences explicitly and carefully. But the thing that is important to understand is what linguists call, the way linguists describe English, it's called a morphophonemic language. The morphemes and the phonemes work together in an integrated way. So to teach the phonology, to teach grapheme phoneme correspondences with a reference to what's underneath will lead to exceptions. But the exceptions aren't, they aren't, they aren't really exceptions. They're exceptions based on a false assumption in our instruction. And I want to emphasize, yeah, so it's a necessary uh, prerequisite of explicit understanding of how words work is an in combination of morphology and phonology. But morphology isn't enough. So let's take a look at these words. I'm going to spell them, and you're going to think about what I'm spelling. And then I violate it, the structure of those words with how I've colored them. I had, I was doing a, I was describing a, to the group today that I did a little pilot thing with grade eight students who were going to high school who were reading like at a grade four level. And the person doing all this testing wanted to start teaching them, not just test them. And so she had me come in and we did this stuff for a while and there was this great stuff happening. And one of the kids, I present, I didn't present it this way, but I had the word um, uh, react. I just wrote it down. And I, I said to the kid, could you read that word for me? And he, and he went, re reeked. And I said, ah, so you mean like my socks reeked from playing soccer yesterday? And he said, yeah, that's what he thought it meant. Now, I had, with this teacher, with this kid, already talked about the ED suffix. And we already learned that the ED suffix can be pronounced in a bunch of ways. Say the word, everybody, you have to do it out loud. Say jump. jump. Say it in the past tense. What does your tongue do at the end of jumped? You say, t. you don't say t, you don't jump t, you jumped. T. How did you write t in jumped? And which graphing? Just the D. How many kids have been taught that the D is a way of writing t? Very, very few. And when this kid makes that mistake, he's doing exactly what he's taught. But because I've taught him this, I could say to that kid, um, oh, wait a second, if you meant it reeked from yesterday, how would you have to spell the end of that? And he could look at the chart and say, oh, ED. Well, try it again. And this time I just said to him, can you see any base or prefix or suffix? And with that amount of instruction, he just said, oh, act, oh react. As soon as he saw the act, he knew that it was react. And that allows us to look at the graphemic structure. So RE is a prefix, and as the base ACT, there's no EA. But in reach, it's a base. And if you have an EA in a base, it will be a digraph. And it can have a few pronunciations, the most common, the long and the short E. Okay, and note, I love this particular example because notice, on the surface, they're, all, they're one, differ by one letter. But at the substructure, the only common grapheme is the R. They each have a single letter grapheme R, but only one has an EA, only one has an A, and only one has a C. The other one has a CH. And the CH is a digraph. It's not a C and an H, it's a CH. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Lynn, I'm gonna be mean to Lynn. Can you spell the word react to me? R-E-A-C-T. And spell the word reach, please. R-E-A-C-H. One more time. R? 
R-E-A-C-H. Ah, now look what we can do from the beginning of instruction. We teach every time we spell a word to a kid, we don't just name the letters. R-E-A-C-H is a bad way to remember the word. If I just go R-E-A-C-H, I've signaled that there's a C-H in there. There's an E-A in there. And, and over time, it becomes a, a, just the way we do it. I went to a grade one class that my friend is working in, and he had the word teacher on the board. Everybody write the word teacher on a piece of paper. Just go ahead, write teacher. Now, I saw the word teacher on the board, and I saw these word sums that I'm showing you there a little bit. And I wanted to assess what the kids knew, because I didn't know this class. So I see the word teacher. I say, could somebody spell that word for me? Now, the word is written on the board. Now it's written on your paper. Who's going to be brave and spell out teacher for me? Be brave. Yes? T-E-A-C-H-E-R. Excellent. And the only thing I'm going to add to what you did, which I haven't taught you yet, is that you made the pauses equal for each thing. But there's two things that happen there. There's a base, T-E-A-C-H, and then a big pause before the E-R because it teaches you that there's the base in it. So this is how, from the beginning, we, every time we talk about words, teachers, I'm encouraging to say, your job is to help kids not be blinded by the surface structure, but reveal the substructure every time you talk about words with them, and then they won't be crazy. Now, I said a little while ago, that the double E is very boring in English and that it only ever represents the phoneme E. And I said that, I, I learned that from this real spelling resource that I was working with and I told my kids that. And then a kid came up to me and said, well, Mr. B, what about Ben? I've been working. Ah, uh, so I said, you're right, that's weird. So what I did is I had learned, I don't have the, the, the chart here, but I'll show you. We just, we just, did the same thing that I did when I knew the answer, but now I didn't know the answer. And the questions are, the first question that I did with really was, what does it mean? What does the word been work mean? I've been working. Okay, we use a sentence. Okay, now what's the next question is how is it built? Is it a base or is it complex? To be and I've been, ah. It turns out there's no double E in bin. It's spell B, spell bin for me. B E E N. Spell teen for me. T double -E, e N. You, you can't, you can say bin and you can say bean and you, you know what I mean. Whether I say bean or bin, we all understand. It's not that bin is lazy, it's how we talk. It's not that we should correct the way we talk. The language happens. The spelling represents the language that happens. This spelling can represent either bin or bean. The single E can be E or E. And the E and the EN doesn't have to represent anything. Except for me, I mean in sound. But you can't do it to teen. You, if I say tin, I've changed the meaning. Because it's a double E digraph, it's a base. So this, what we are trying to do is get into the substructure of this stuff. So the big ideas in terms of this structured word inquiry stuff, it has to be the first point. That English spelling is ordered, an ordered meaning-based system. Now, I haven't given you enough evidence for that. I've given you a little bit of evidence, maybe with that some words like does are more regular than you thought. But this is what... Lingu we can go to linguistics and we can find this. I'm going to give you more evidence of it. Noam Chomsky and, and, and Haley said, you know, it's a near optimal system for the representation of meaning. Um, Carol Chomsky, Vinetsky, they all talk about how order it is in a way that we don't usually in schools. And this means that it's a suitable context for scientific inquiry. We can study science about molecules. We can, use, we can study science about uh, biology. We can study science about everything. Why not put the writing system under the microscope and study it? And then we don't only learn how to develop and test hypotheses like we are in the other subjects. We're also learning about the language system that we need for every subject. And the cool thing about scientific inquiry is that we get to teach this concept, and I can't overemphasize the importance of this concept. 
Some of you may have heard of Occam's razor, but it's the basic, a basic principle of scientific inquiry at every level of science is that scientists seek the deepest structures that account for the greatest number of cases. If two people have differing hypotheses about something and one explains it more fully, it takes fewer steps to explain, it's a better scientific answer. And it doesn't care, it doesn't matter who said it. The, 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 the description of phenomena that gets the deeper structures and account for graded cases is the better scientific answer. And this is a principle that I can show you videos where I teach that idea while we're studying the word structure. Actually, the word structured. The other thing is that analysis and structure and meaning of words deepens understanding in any subject area. Because once you get the tools to dive into this stuff in science class, when you introduce new language or a math class, you make connections of meaning between words that kids know and words that kids don't know. And, and you, you put them together, the matrices and the word sums really help, but the tools to know how to dive into dictionaries and all that stuff is very helpful. It's not about spelling accuracy. I'll let you read that instead of me reading it to you. Now, what I want, the reason I'm showing this video is this is a grade seven kid who has entered the school with a teacher who's been working with this stuff for a long time. And it's not that this kid has been studying this since he's in kindergarten, it's, he's fairly new to this class. And what I'm showing you today sounds complex, it's new to you, it sounds like too hard for the kids. So it's good to see some examples of kids at the, you know, what seems like a pinnacle of what kids could do. And I can show you kids, young kids doing this stuff and everything else, but this, show you, this isn't too hard for kids. And watch what it does. The word dissident is divided into three morphemes, which are D-I-S, S-I-D-E, no E, plus E-N-T. Um, the suffix in this word is E-N-T, and the prefix is D-I-S. However, the base element in this word is S-I-D-E, no E, which originates from the Latin root sedere to sit. Um, an intriguing fact about the Latin root sedere to sit is that it sit or to settle. It forms two base elements, which are S-I-D-E, no E, and S-E-D. Um, both base elements are bound base elements, meaning they do not make perfect sense on their own, and they need a um, prefix or suffix to um, make sense. Yeah. Um, and um, the meaning of the word um, dissident is to literally sit against authority, and um, related words meaning uh, related words are words that share the same base element, which would be president and resident, like settle and preside and reside. Yeah, and um, the word dissident links to the current situation in Libya as the Libyan president, Muammar Gaddafi, um, overruled Libya. Um, he, um, he cheated in an election. Um, he, even when the votes were against him, he still cl claimed to be Libya's president. And he stripped um, Libya's citizens from many rights, such as democracy. And now, um, and now the Libyan citizens are dissidents fight are they are um, their dissidents who are rebelling against Gaddafi and are fighting for against injustice yeah and um, I believe that bystanders are the reason and are responsible for um, the terrible things in the world and the increase of perilous things and um, the power and control of a certain person and that um, if you just sit and do not act and it does have an effect however a negative of it has a negative impact however um, when you stand up and act or speak, then it does have a positive impact and it does make a difference. So um, the word, um, the word um, dissident, um, and this also links to the quote by Albert Einstein, the, word, the world is a dangerous place not because of the people who do evil, but because of the people who sit and let it happen. So right now in Libya, there are dissidents who are sacrificing themselves and putting everything on the lines for the good of many. Now, if a grade seven student can not only learn the linguistic details in there that are new to you, bound bases and twin bases and all these terms that you haven't heard before, but it's not that they just learned those terms, it's that they used them. He used them for understanding of a social studies assignment. And if you go to the website, um, and you can email me if you want to get this, but it's possible to find it, the, the, the assignment that led to that and answers from other kids, 
and all the kids are saying these wonderful things and the way that the teacher had the kids investigate the concepts was to use the skills of learning about how language systems work, the histories of words, the structures of words. And it, it isn't just that they learned those things. This kid could not have had those ideas without the leverage of the understanding of the language system. So it's not about accurate spelling. Now, just a quick look at the, some of the research evidence that I've been involved in. Now, I told you a little bit about the intervention study, and I, I can't resist my little plug. That intervention study is the activities that I did in that study are in here. If I have a, couple, a few copies left if people are interested. But the other research that I've been involved in is, is doing a, a meta-analysis of uh, morphological instruction. So John Kirby and I and Ellen Deacon and Dalhousie did this, uh, one of them, and uh, some, there's, now there's, there's four of these meta-analyses. And when you do, um, if you're trying to make changes to policy of instruction, you don't do it based on one study. You need to have information from a bunch of studies. So a meta-analysis is a study of studies. And so we now have four about morphological instruction. And if we just take a quick look, all of them are saying it benefits everybody. The studies that looked at the difference of less able and more able all found that it helped the less able the most. And that was a particularly strong effect in our study. I'm happy to share that paper with anyone who's interested. But the effects were strikingly stronger for the less able kids. And it makes sense to me because the less able kids are telling us, I don't succeed in this reading and writing stuff when you only give me cues about the sound letter correspondences. You need to give me something else. And morphology is a way of giving them something else for which they don't have a weakness. If dyslexics frequently have a poor phonemic awareness. You, we're asking them to rely on their weakness in their system as the only thing, whereas when we talk about how these structures work with matrices and word sums, we give them access to something they're not weak in, problem solving, right? Sorry? Yes. And, and we don't force, and this is so important for you guys, I want to say this before, when you work with older kids, can you think of a more shameful thing to do to a teenager than to make them walk around with a grade four book that is the level of, of, of reading ability they have, but not their intellectual ability? It's a shaming experience. Whereas when we, and I'll show you some matrices and such, when you investigate these matrices, you get kids the opportunity to read words at their intellectual level without having to go through pages of text that they don't understand. And that's how they can get practice at dealing with text at their level. And they're doing problem solving, it's an, it's an engaging activity, and they just soak it up because it's the first time they've been in a reading, inter, a reading specialty class where it made sense. The other thing that's really important is that we found, the studies that looked at the younger and the old, and we looked at this more specifically, that from preschool to grade two, the effects were as strong or stronger as the effects in grade three and up. And people used to say, without evidence, they didn't claim evidence, but they used to say, if you do morphology, wait until later, it's more complex. But then when you do that, you are misteaching the phonology at the beginning and you're not giving access and we didn't have evidence. Now we have evidence that it helps from the beginning. And that way we can teach kids and not have to later unteach them. That do and does thing, why not use the word do and does as a way to introduce the system? And then the other study based on those lessons, we found that um, kids learned the meanings of words, not only the words they were exposed to better than the control group, but they were able to define words better that they weren't taught, but which were related to words they were taught. So generative vocabulary learning, which is what we're always looking for in vocabulary. So that's another, I'm happy, anybody who is curious about that, I'm happy to send that on. So the structure word inquiry process, and we won't be able to do too much of it, but is just the idea of starting with a word, and I want to do one, is you catch kids with an interesting question, present a set of words that makes the pattern more salient, help them hypothesize. We don't actually have to know the answer, but we have to know how to look for the answer, and guide the, the testing of those hypotheses, and then practice. And one quick one and we'll see. For example, the word sign. What's the, why is there a G in sign? Well, if we ask, what does it mean? I can assign my name. I can stop at a traffic sign. Okay, now we look at how it's built. 
can't peel anything off, it must be a base. Hmm, I stop at a traffic sign, or maybe I have to look at relatives, or a traffic signal. All of a sudden, the G is there. Sign, signal, they're connected in meaning. And now we learn why there's a G, and then we look at these matrices. This is the first letter lesson in the intervention. We did this earlier today. But you arrange the, the family of words that share the spelling of the base, but not necessarily the pronunciation of the base. And now we can build the vocabulary. So in our study, we found that kids were better at defining any of the words in here, design, designate, assignment, signify. We didn't test all those words. But of the words we tested, they were better. And they were better at defining words like significant that aren't even there. And, and that, this whole, so the, that was the intervention. It just looked, it, we used these things and we figured out how you know, like signature, hey, the E goes away. Well, we, we, we use these, this is actually, we give them these morpheme charts to work from. This is actually a picture from the intervention. And this is our morpheme chart all over there. Those are all picture, those are all sticky notes with affix hypotheses. Because the kids kept having these ideas and I, I couldn't let them put them on the chart because I had to test them first. So I said, okay, let's put a hypothesis chart. And then I'd have to check them out and the kids would bug me every day. When are you going to go through those theories? Because they want to get their affixes on the official class list. So I would have to go through them and, work, and we would work together to figure out which ones get to go there. And they had to put the, the affix, the word sum that they, they predicted for it, and their name. And they were dying to get their affixes on our class chart. This isn't look, say, cover, write, check. This isn't rote memory. And look at them. One kid's looking at a dictionary to test a hypothesis. This kid is adding one to the real list. That kid is adding one to the hypothesis chart. And that green thing with things falling out, those are all spelling questions for Mr. B that kids are independently putting. This is independent critical thinking and problem solving about words. And we look at, we go through these words. Oh, look at that. S is a way of writing s or z, because I have sign and I have design. So we, we do problem solving of phonology too. Signature, wait a second. That, there's no E there. Well, we have to find out what the conventions are for that. And what, that's what we do here. And it turns out, whenever you add a vowel suffix, it replaces single silent T. So we, we, do, we help the kids develop this hypothesis. I've used this, this page with grade twos and threes. And with this evidence, we collect the data just like a scientist would, and then we're, I'm able to get them to that hypothesis, and then we test it with a whole bunch of words. And we find out all sorts of other things, and we learn that vowel suffixes replace single silent T's, and it's just a consistent, consistent rule. Consonant suffixes don't. And I, I see teacher resources books that say I, ING and ED replace E's, which isn't actually true. They replace single silent T's, because if, if otherwise, uh, agreeing would drop an E because it ends in an E, but it's a si it has to be a, double, a single silent E that's replaced. And they go through all that work, but they fail to tell the teacher, to tell the kids, there's nothing special about ING and ED. They're like any other vowel suffix. How could we not know the terms vowel suffix and consonant suffix when it's that important? And consonant suffixes never cause doubling. And then we can practice. So these are examples of the lessons in that thing. Um, and I'm almost done, but I, ch -ch -ch -ch. no, you're not, oh, well, this is a good one to see. I, there's one, I, this is a, a, obviously a, a, from a bigger uh, presentation, but I, I've organized it, so there's a couple things I want to get to, and I have like one minute. But this is what we're talking about. I love this line. The problem of education is to make the people see the woods by means of the trees. When any word that we've addressed here, the word, I, it wasn't about teaching how to spell sign, it wasn't about teaching you signal, it wasn't about teaching you does, it was using those words to teach you the system. And when we do that for kids, we take the deepest structures and we find out that they account for all these words, and that's not comprehensive. And our research shows when you study some of these words, they have access to all of them. Not all of them may be exaggeration, but they have access to more. And th so this is the kind of work we do. Now, I want to see where one slide is, and then I will stop, because it's a good one. I'm gonna, I want to give you a little spelling test. Can you take a, paper, a pen and out? This is really going to be short. I often lie. It won't be too long. It is a, it is a short test. That's very true. I'm going to present a word. 
It has a base and a suffix. I said I wasn't going to move and I lied there too. Um, a base and a suffix, and all I want you to do is to write the suffix. Okay? So I'm just going to flash it not very long, so you got to be looking. Ready? And don't share it with anybody. Cover it up if you write it. Here's the word. Write the suffix. Now, if you're like every other group I've ever seen, we have two hypotheses in the room. Okay? Who said Tiawan? Who said Iowan? Okay. Well, it's, we are trained teachers and we have a question. What do we do? Well, we often go to teacher resources. Well, here's a teacher resource and it tells us T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N, and it gives us the exa these examples, action, invention, location. And the Oxford English Dictionary says T-I-O-N is a suffix and its examples were completion and relation. But the thing that we're forgetting is that this is actually an empirical question. We don't just get the answer for something, we can test it ourselves. And this, it, so it warrants scientific inquiry, and scientific inquiry is a way to build systemic understanding and generative learning. So let's take a look with the same, and this will be the last thing I do. Same questions. What does it mean? How is it built? What are the relatives? What's the pronunciation? Well, to ask a question, I want to find an answer, okay. How is it built? Well, that's our question. Is it T-I-O-N or I-O-N? Well, either hypothesis has consequences. If it's T-I-O-N, the base must be Q-U-E-S. If it's I-O-N, it could be Q-U-E-S-T, which makes more sense. Quest doesn't mean anything. We're done. We don't have to go to anybody else. It works. The structure works, but the meaning doesn't work. How do we know it's really connected? Well, we go to origin then, and I went to the origin, and I find that question has the root query for ask, seek, and so does quest. And I went to Etymology Online, and it actually says gain as well. So there's a meaning connection, so we can test these things. And I can go to my word search, and I find all these words. I don't have time to go through how we prove this, but we have to find out which ones really match and which ones don't. And we get rid of sequester, and we get rid of bequest, because it doesn't work, and we get a bequest. And now we have 20, oh, many. And I'm just going to give the kids 18 of them and ask them to go and dive in and make word sums with them, and they make these word sums. Question is one of them, and I can say that when you ask a question, it's like going on a quest. But this is a lot of text, a lot of information. Well, wouldn't it be cool if we could show them the interrelation of structure and meaning? And that's what the matrix does. All of that information is held within that matrix. In fact, that matrix could build more than those word sums. I built that matrix from those words, but that matrix builds more than those words. And the process of doing this is just so valuable. And we work through the words, notice that conquest is there. That idea of gain is in there now. So, I should stop. I wanted to show one more thing. This is the last bit. Notice, teacher resource gave these words with a T-I-O-N, None of them could have one, could they? Oxford gave those two words. Neither of them have a T-I-O-N. We, 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 we treat authoritative references as if they are inherently correct, and we just follow them. But if we go for the deepest structure that account for the greatest number of cases, the Oxford explains fewer cases than I do. In fact, it doesn't explain any cases. And a, a kind of a cool little feather in our cap recently, there's these discussions that I have with a bunch of people, and it turned out Etym Online, which is a really great etymology insight, got wind of the fact that we were, we were saying, well, T.O. and Clear is in suffix. He emailed us and got into this great conversation, and he said, you're right. And he changed his de definition based on how we talked about it, away from Oxford to this. And it, it, the point is, we get to engage in that conversation. And the idea is that we've missed this because we have been focusing on pronunciation without reference to the meaning and the structure and all that stuff. And when we, we do that, we lose the fact that to ask a question, that the pronunciation of the base shifts. We have a base spelled Q-U-S-T, but it's pronounced quest in question questionable, but quest in these words. And now we can talk about the grapheme phoneme combinations and that the T can represent all of those pronunciations. And we can do the same thing with those words too. 
And I think that's where I should stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. Sorry to do that so fast. Any, any questions? Yeah. Ah, good question. Yeah. Well, the, a key thing that we need to know is that the base carries the underlying denotation of any of the words it builds. So the, the base really carries a meaning that the echo of that meaning is going to be in any word that it builds. But affixes aren't so much like that. They're not, you can't treat affixes as if they carry meaning that way. Sometimes affixes just change the meaning of a word, not in a reliable way. And you know, so we can have the suffix um, re often means again, but not always. And able means more than just able. Comfortable isn't able to comfort, yeah, right? That was, that was yeah, so you have to, exactly. That's right, and, and a lot of resources, exactly. And so we have to, that's an excellent question. You can't add up the meanings of the affixes and add, with the meaning of the base and say that word must mean this. Good point. But they have, they have grammatical roles that are very helpful to know. So we can teach about grammar through this, parts of speech. Right? Certain stuff, ly is an adverb, it forms an adverb. And y forms adjectives and so that kind of stuff. Other question? If you go to the website, we have the handout, lots of videos of this instruction, lots of re free resources to, to play with. It's dis and then you'll find links to, on your reference list, there's something called Real Spellers, which is a place where teachers and kids posting investigations that are just amazing. And finally, the, uh, um, oh, another question. Um, not this specific presentation, no. But we're going to try and work something out so that you can get it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's lo lots of this material is on the site, yeah. The presentation is being videotaped and it will be up on the site. So you can go back and review. Yeah. It's an excellent tool for ESL students as well. Well, it absolutely is. When, um, Frank, most of my work is at international schools. So most of the schools I go to is like, you know, people from 80 countries. Um, and the thing that's really valuable, when you think about that, um, the matrix, if the kid knows the word ease, so on the book I have the matrix E-A-S-E, -E, and you can show that it's related to disease. And they might not have the word disease in the vocabulary, but you, you can, oh, disease is something, a system that's not at ease, okay. And if you know Quest, but you don't know Quest, they have these weird, ESL kids have funny holes in their knowledge that, that we just assume they have. The matrix brings together words that are connected in meaning and structure, so it's the exact thing that they need to fill in the holes. Yeah, that's very important for ESL.